All right. If you remember from last week, we looked at the taxonomy and the classes of the arthropods. So you learned what it takes to be an insect, what it takes to be a crustacean, a diplopod, a millipod, etc., etc., right? So uh, this week, we're going to start focusing in on the insects themselves, so that one class that makes up insects, and we're going to start by looking at their basic anatomy. So over the next several lectures, we're going to focus on different areas. We're going to start this week with the uh, head area, with the eyes and the antennae. Now, the reason that we go over the anatomy of insects before I start teaching about individual insects is because anatomy is the foundation of understanding bugs. If you think about it, parasitic arthropods have developed amazing strategies to live successfully while exploiting humans and animals. Uh, a strong understanding of this anatomy, of these um, exploits or of these strategies uh, will help you figure out what an unknown insect is and it will help you figure out what it is doing to an animal. So if you know what that external and internal internal anatomy is, and especially if you pay attention to the mouth parts. So we're going to be spending quite a bit of time on the mouth parts over the next uh, couple of lectures. You can actually make some logical leaps and say, okay, this, this insect is flattened and it's got piercing and sucking mouth parts. So it's got to be hanging out underneath the fur and piercing through the skin to drink blood. So if you know what each one of these uh, bits of anatomy does and how it can change, then you don't have to necessarily know what the insect is. You can try to figure it out. So this is one of the major reasons that um, I have both a lecture and a lab section for this course so that you can build on this foundation for the rest of the semester and into the future. And in lab, you're going to be looking at uh, the anatomy of the arthropod and using that anatomy to identify it. In lecture, we're going to be talking about the form and the function of this arthropod and how these different bits of anatomy actually lend to its success as being a parasite or a predator or something of that nature. So let's start with the overall body form of the insect. So here we go. This is our basic body form as illustrated by a grasshopper. Grasshopper bodies are ancient. They represent what we think the ancestor of all insects looked like approximately. So they're a great place to start. We're going to go over the basic body plan of the grasshopper. And then as we get into more specialized insects, I'll keep reminding you about how these different body parts have been modified from the basic grasshopper plan through evolution and through natural selection. So every time I talk about different body parts on different insects, I'd like you to compare and contrast them with the grasshopper. Compare and contrast with the things that you've learned both here in lecture and you will be dissecting a grasshopper in lab. So you'll be able to see each one of these body parts up close and personal. So all insects are going to have the same parts, same basic layout, the same basic plan. It's just that some have been very heavily modified over many millions of years, and now they're used for very different purposes. Okay, so on to the grasshopper. Here we go. Here's our basic grasshopper. The basic body is cylindrical and elongate. So you can see it's this basic long cylinder going on here. It has this sort of overall robust appearance. Inside is the hemocyl filled with hemolymph and all the organs are hanging out inside. And then externally, the plan is pretty straightforward. Anteriorly, you've got the head. Then in the middle, you have this thoracic region with the wings and the legs. And then posteriorly, you have the abdomen and the sexual organs, or the ovipositor in females, okay? So it's a pretty basic thing, anterior head, posterior uh, sexual organs, or the ovipositor, the reproductive organs. Okay, let's go over this body plan bit by bit. Remember that there are a few things that make an insect an insect. First, there are three body regions, at least in the adult form of an insect. We've got our head anteriorly, the middle portion is the thorax, and the posterior portion is called the abdomen. So they have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. Second, there are three thoracic pairs of legs. 
So these three pairs of legs for a total of six legs are hanging off of the different segments of the thorax. Finally, there's a single pair of antennae coming off anteriorly from the head. So we've got three body regions, head, thorax, and abdomen, three pairs of legs on that thoracic region, and a pair of antennae. These, all these things have to be present to make up an insect. Now let's look at the head. So the head is made up of many sclerotized segments for, fused together to form a capsule. So remember we talked about sclerotin or that protein that is embedded in chitin to make things hard. Uh, when we talk about the word sclerotize, sclerotize means that there is protein embedded that hardened this head capsule. Okay, so it's hardened through the use of sclerotin. So there's many sclerotized segments fused together to form a head capsule. It's very, very rigid to protect the brain and to give strength to the mouth parts. The main use of the head capsule is as a center of for sensory input. It houses the eyes, both the simple and the compound eyes, which we'll talk about in just a second, and the antennae. The antennae are most commonly used for olfaction. So instead of a nose, these insects have antennae. Insects will use this uh, sense of smell, so to speak, to, to find odors in their environment. So they use these odors as a way to find hosts, as a way to find food, or to find places to oviposit or lay their eggs. In some insects, the antennae can also give a tactile input, so they can be used as a sense of touch in the case of, say, cockroaches. This is why you tend to see cockroaches with these long, thin antennae that are constantly moving around. It's as if it's that sense of smell and sense of touch all put together in one organ. Finally, the head is where the food is ingest ingested. We've got the mouth parts hanging out there at the bottom, so this gives the insects access to energy. So let's start with the compound eyes. The compound eyes can be found near the dorsolateral surfaces of the head capsule. So remember, dorsal means the top, lateral means the side, so it's on the top side of the head capsule here. These uh, compound eyes are usually very large. It's usually what people associate with insects, you know, bug-eyed. That's what they're talking about, are these compound eyes. Now, they're called compound eyes because they are made up of lots of little tiny lenses called omatidia. Singular uh, word for this is omatidium. So these omatidia work together. So a whole bunch of different lenses working together. Each single omatidium will form an image or capture an image, which it then transmits to the brain. The brain compiles all of the images from all these different uh, omatidia to form a singular image. So basically the brain knits everything together into a single object. Now, between these uh, compound eyes, in some insects, we have what are called the simple eyes or the ocelli. Not every insect has ocelli. It's possible to have zero ocelli or ocelli. Um, the, the ones that do, though, the ones that have these ocelli have either one, two, or three simple eyes. Okay, so you can see uh, on this praying mantis right here, got the big compound eyes, and then these three dots, bam, 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 right there, those are the ocelli. Those are the simple eyes right there in the center. <clears throat> now, the simple eyes work for light detection. They don't form actual pictures. Instead, the ocelli register if light is bright or if it is dim or how it changes. So this can help the insect uh, or alert the insect to potential danger. So think about when a predator comes along. It's going to cast a shadow over that insect, right? So these simple eyes are going to pick up this rapid change from bright to dark, and it's going to cause a reaction. This is one of the reasons it can be difficult to uh, sneak up on an insect. Anytime there's a change in light, they notice that very, very quickly. These eyes are also really important to what we call photoperiodism. This is a developmental response to relative lengths of light and dark periods. So it'll help the insect determine if those uh, days are getting longer or if they're getting shorter. And then the insect is going to react accordingly. So as days get longer, many insects are going to start looking for a mate or looking for food, maybe looking for places to oviposit their eggs. 
As the days get shorter, that indicates winter is coming, right? So as these days get shorter, insects are going to start storing fat so they can make it over the winter. Or maybe they're going to start looking for places to overwinter. Or maybe they're going to start pupating. They're basically getting ready for winter at that point. So these uh, these acelli will help with this photoperiodism, with this regulation of uh, body functions based on relative light and dark cycles. Now, let's watch a video illustrating how the eye works. Let us now enter the compound eye and see the world as viewed by an insect. Here is how the world might appear to an insect from within a single omatidium. Each omatidium views the visual scene according to its position in the compound eye and the width of its lens. The view from each omatidium is then integrated by the nervous system to provide a view of the entire visual scene. Here is the mosaic view as observed by an insect with this type of eye. The lens and cones of insect omatidia are not capable of changing their focal length, so insects are probably nearsighted and distant objects appear blurry. Note that the observed scene is most distinctive when broken patterns caused by the edges of structures occur within the field of view of a single omatidium or between adjacent omatidia. Notice how conspicuous the pattern is when it has sharp contrasts of light and dark within the field of view of a single omatidium. Conversely, the scene is least distinctive when a nearly similar pattern occurs within the field of a single omatidium or between adjacent omatidia. Likewise, movement within the field of a single omatidium is poorly observed, but movement across the field of several omatidia provides a high degree of sensory input. Here is how something close might appear as it moves past. Note that the most information is provided as it cuts across the fields of adjacent omatidia. Finally, let us juxtapose a compound eye from a species such as a dragonfly that has many more omatidia per unit area. Note that by increasing the number of omatidia per unit area, a greater number of individual omatidia detect broken patterns within their field of view as compared to the single larger omatidium. Since each omatidium acts as a visual unit, this has the effect of increasing the detail or resolution that the insect can detect in its field of view. Note how many omatidia the flying insect crosses in this situation. This increases the sensitivity of the dragonfly's eye to the presence of its prey. Therefore, insect vision is developed to be most sensitive to changing patterns in movement rather than to a highly resolved, detailed view of the visual scene, such as is found with the vertebrate eye. Now, you can find that video on uh, eCampus. I put it up there for you. This is The guy who did that is a, or was a professor at Texas A&M, so he has a good series of videos that explain things very simply like this. So I have a bunch of them up on eCampus for you if you're interested in looking at that uh, alone. Now, the other major sensory uh, input organ of the uh, head capsule is the antennae, or are the antennae. The antennae are basically hollow tubes of exoskeleton that have nerves running through them. At the very end of this tube, there's this tiny pore or tiny opening that allows for airborne chemical compounds to enter. The tubes are filled with hemolymph so that the compounds will dissolve into the hemolymph and attach to receptor cells at the end of the nerves. Th this will excite the nerves and they will send information back to the brain, which the insect will then interpret. Okay? So it's just basically a delivery system for nerves to pick up these odors, these airborne chemical compounds. Now, depending on the type of insect, it might just need a little single nerve 
very, very tiny amount of input uh, in its antennae to get all of the information that it needs. Other insects may, be, may need a huge bundle of nerves or a whole bunch of nerves individually to get all the info it needs. It just causes these antennae to manifest in uh, different shapes or different sizes. So if you think about the type of antennae that you're seeing on an insect, you could probably make a logical leap as to how these insects get their sensory input, their olfactory input. So there are some major antennal shapes that you're going to see over and over and over again, 11 of them to be exact. The first is called cetaceous. A cetaceous uh, antennal shape or cetaceous antennae looks like this one up here on the right. This means bristle-like. This can be found in dragonflies. These tend to be very small, very short, and they don't really stick out a lot. Just that single um, nerve going through there. The second is called filiform. Looks something like this. So it's these filiform antennae. These are uh, thread-like antennae. Uh, and this is common in a lot of beetles and in cockroaches. So those long thread-like antennae are called filiform. Okay. These filiform antennae are very, very thin and they're very mobile. So this is why they can be used, like in cockroaches, as a tactile input device as well as olfactory. The third type of um, antennae are called maniliform. They look kind of like a string of beads. You can find these in termites most commonly. The fourth is called serrate. This looks a little bit like a saw. So you got these saw-toothed uh, types of antennae. So an example is over here, right there. So you see how it's sort of got these sawtooth-like uh, uh, lumps on it? That's serrate antennae. <clears throat> uh, certain types of click beetles are going to have these serrate antennae. Next is clavate antennae. Clavate antennae start out thin, then they gradually thicken at the end to a club shape. So certain carrion beetles will have clavate antennae. Capitate antennae are a lot like clavate, except they are thin throughout most of the antenna length, then they abruptly widen. So it kind of looks like the head of a pin sitting on the end of this very thin antennal segment. Uh, this is what butterflies have. So those uh, stereotypical butterfly antennae are called capitate antennae. Lamellate antennae, these are found in scarab beetles. These have what are called nested plates at the end. So they look like this over here. So you see that you've got this long antenna uh, thing and then these really big plates sort of stacked one on top of the other. They actually look a lot like eyelashes. So my sister and I used to call uh, beetles that had this, these scarab beetles, the eyelash beetles, because they look like big old eyelashes on the end of these antennae. <clears throat> Pectinate antennae are comb-like, so they look like a comb. And uh, plumos antennae are brush-like, or they have lots and lots of dense hairs. So an example of plumos antennae are down here. So these plumos antennae, uh, these can be found on insects that need to find food or find hosts or mates through olfaction. So they need to be able to take in a lot of uh, chemicals, sensory input in this manner. Uh, Insects that use pheromones or airborne hormones to find mates over long distances have very, very dense plumos antennae. So the more hairs there are, the more nerves there are sort of poking out into the world. And that means the more chemicals that can be uh, noticed and taken up out of the air and a more precise direction from which these chemicals are coming can be ascertained. So the more uh, brushier, the more plumos these antennae, the more likely it is they use airborne chemicals to do something. You're going to see these types of antennae in uh, insects that need to find hosts like mosquitoes or in moths that use a lot of pheromones to find mates. So these are plumos antennae. Geniculate antennae are found in weevils and in ants, and they are elbowed antennae. They have this elbow bend, almost a right uh, angle bend, partway bend partway through. And finally, aerostate antennae. These just look kind of weird, and that's what this is right here. These are aerostate antennae. These have this large pouch that have a little bristle coming off uh, the middle of that pouch. We find these a lot in true flies, like blow flies or flesh flies. All right. 
So we're going to stop there with the uh, major sensory input organs of the head. Up next, we'll start talking about the mouth parts. Let me know if you have any questions.